Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much for this kind introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank to the Rachel Carson Center for the opportunity uh, to be a part of this enriching <coughs> research environment. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the book project that I have been working on here at RCC. Uh, of course, it's an ongoing work. I'm still working on it, and I will share with you one part of it today. <clears throat> I want to start with a headline. A journey to yourself away from the cities where you feel alienated. I stumbled upon this headline recently on the website of a well-known Turkish ecological living NGO since 1990s. The headline helped promote the Turkish branch of Woofing. It means Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. It's an international organization that guides people to volunteer in organic farms and ecological communities. It is aimed at bringing mostly an educated middle class back to rural ideals and practices. This can be easily seen as a romantic escape, but I believe there is more than that in this movement. It appeals, I think, to a current place pathology and the need in a sector of society. A state of urban alienation and journey to self in the rural is a prominent interest in, of many recent Turkish films. I see that as a reflection of an ecological as well as social unconscious. I started this research with an aim to reconsider Turkish film history from an eco-critical perspective. My broader research uh, includes an overview of early Turkish films made between 1950 and 1980 with themes related to environmental issues. I mainly examine the period from late 90s, looking at films of different genres and styles. This period actually uh, in general referred as New Turkish Cinema and represents a rebirth for the film, Turkish film industry. A whole uh, new generation of educated directors made their first films in this period. But at the same time, a new socio-environmental agenda emerged in relation to urban alienation with major transformations in urban ecology, mainly in Istanbul. So beyond popular and art house films of drama and comedy, which I grouped as urban stories, eco-nostalgia films, and back to rural comedies, the examples I chose for this talk are the realist rural films of this period. Uh, my main observation is that there is a significant difference between early and recent films in ecological understandings. In the realist rural films after 1990s, the environment emerges as a living ecosystem. Non-human nature becomes a filmic character in company with the human. I consider this as unfolding of an ecological awareness and want to place it into its social context, mainly related to urban alienation. These films actually don't have themes directly related to environmental issues, rather a distinctive nature-based film aesthetic underpins the narratives as they deal with human and non-human nature relations in a personal context, building up an intuitive approach. Uh, I take this term, intuitive approach, as reference to an intimate human encounter with non-human world. That brings out a sense of being a part of nature and hints at the recognition of nature's intrinsic value. 
This approach is uh, in compliance with ecocentric worldview, which defends the idea that natural entities have their own good for their own sake, independent, independent of human good and interests. Quoting uh, Canadian ecologist and eco-philosopher Stan Rowe, this represents a value shift from Homo sapiens to planet Earth of which humanity is a part. These films project an objective view about the nature's intrinsic value as they foreground the equal presence of natural entities along with humans and create a sense of wholeness. Some of them embody a subjective view. Uh, some of them embody a subjective view as well uh, with spiritual significances of human and non-human nature relations. So looking at both aesthetic and narrative qualities, I argue that realism and slow rhythm in these films support the emergence of such an approach. And so today, uh, I will briefly talk about the early Turkish films to reveal the shift in ecological understandings in recent films then at the rest of the talk, uh, I want to focus on some films to show an example of how I see my arguments. In Turkish cinema, starting from 1960s, films invoked the environment in terms of human livelihood, social rights, and national identity. Environmental agents are the surrounding elements and resources, resources for human life. There is a perspective of separation and pragmatism. Therefore, uh, I define what I observe in early films as environment-related themes and what is present in recent films as ecological identities. Uh, the first films that reflected on environmental-related issues in Turkish film history actually emerged with rural stories. In the early years of the Turkish Republic, along with many components of social and cultural life, film was seen as an effective tool in the construction of national identity. At the same time, the first attempts of portraying harsh environmental circumstances in rural were subjected to censorship. The earliest examples of social realistic rural films, Dark World and Land, both produced in 1952, were censored with a claim of showing Turkish land infertile. So uh, the films were permitted to show rural nature as mostly a pastoral location or an exotic background until the 1960s. Uh, this act of censorship uncovers the anthropocentric state mentality that valued nature as a manifestation of a strong national identity. And uh, as the state twisted socio-environmental <coughs> realities on behalf of empowering <coughs> the image of that identity. The application of a new constitution following a coup d'etat in 1960, however, brought a more libertarian atmosphere for political discussions. And social realistic rural narratives in films came into scene. Uh, between 1960 and the 1970s, many films told stories of Anatolian villagers and their uh, labor relationship with natural environment. Environmental issues such as water or land ownership were supportive elements of the stories for giving social messages on political awakening, the critic of feudal traditions, or, and also the critic of capitalism. So within a social realistic frame, nature was something to be saved or to work on primarily for human well-being. 
environmental issues then became a mirror for an imaginary of a productive nation and a politically conscious society who learn how to claim rights within modern relations against conservative traditions. At the same time, uh, socially realistic urban stories with the subject of internal immigration from rural to urban came onto screens. Uh, the place of attraction was always Istanbul in these immigration films. Istanbul uh, was once a place identified as paved with gold and it became a hot spot to conquer for these immigrants. These films portrayed the socio-spatial exclusion of villager immigrants resulted from cultural conflicts, lack of work safety, and illegal housing in shanty towns at the outskirts of the city. So, with the 1990s, with the new Turkish cinema since the 1990s, the city paved with gold has turned into a chaos to run away from. Directors of this period mostly turned away from urban as a location and tended back towards rural stories, both in popular and art house films. Research on this period remarked this tendency, actually, with terms such as rural films or homeland movies. The urban films of this period still deal with Istanbul as a city with a distorted ecology and a chaotic non-identity. Most films identify the aggressive concretion with nearly dystopian scenes where green spaces are excluded from urban landscape. In general terms, these urban stories evolve around characters that don't have a sense of belonging, who survive in the city more than live. Portrayal of Istanbul as a habitat in these films reminds the term solastalgia, coined by environmental philosopher Glenn Albrecht in 2003. It defines the pain experienced from the recognition that the place where one resides is under immediate assault. Well, uh, exclusion of green spaces and doing by destroying is at the core of socio-environmental transformations in Istanbul since 1990s. Continuous mega construction projects lead to destruction and privatization of forest land, natural protected areas, farmlands, stream beds, and archaeological areas. Here I want to show you these satellite images. I think they uh, show very well how the constructional development in Istanbul has affected the uh, urban landscape, especially since 1990s. And here I, uh, this, this is a map that was prepared, uh, that's from a website that was prepared by the Association of Architects in Private Practice. And it shows very well the intensity of these uh, small or big constructional development projects that has been going on in Istanbul since 1990s. Uh, I especially highlighted some of these uh, recent uh, big projects that occupy a larger uh, place in, in the landscape of the city. <laughs> yeah. And here I want to show you some real Im images of this impact. Uh, this is Third Bridge, and we can see uh, how the construction of the Third Bridge had an impact on the ecosystem in the northern forests of Istanbul. And this is the third airport construction, which is still going on. And it occupies actually uh, <laughs> a place more than 76 million square meters uh, in the remaining green areas of Istanbul. 
And these are places, uh, examples from the city center, uh, the green spaces, like very little amount of green spaces that were left in the city center, all transformed into luxury residences. And this is a project which is still uh, uh, in the project phase, but it's basically uh, a project to connect Black Sea with Marmara Sea and create a sort of second Bosphorus in Istanbul. And all the, there's a huge ex the resistance against this project. And the ecologists, the scientists, they all argue that it could be actually an ecological disaster for the, for the city if it is ever applied. Well, culture is also being transformed with the ecology. Gentrification projects on symbolic cultural places, such as historical movie theaters, patisseries, bookstores, and historical buildings transforming into shopping malls are recent examples of the replacement of cultural memory. Uh, I chose examples from Beyoğlu district in <coughs> Taksim area in Istanbul, and I think it shows very well uh, the situation. In the Beyoğlu district, the transformation from an intellectual center of alternative culture into a center of luxury consumption for tourists reveals how a reproduction of space has no attachment to historical and cult cultural heritage. This naturally brings about the erasure of representation and memory for some sectors of society. Uh, this is a well-known satirical magazine uh, in Turkey, and it attracts attention to the, construction, to the aggressive constructional development projects uh, and how that became a state policy, actually. Uh, and we see some physical uh, effects of the transformations <coughs> and restoration projects. Uh, this historical building uh, has actually has a history, very important cultural and social, uh, has, has a history of being a very important cultural and social gathering place, but now it transformed into, it's privatized and it's transformed into a commercial center basically. And there are a lot of examples like that that turned into shopping malls. Uh, and here I chose the example of Robinson Crusoe bookstore removal. Uh, because I think it reflects very well uh, the importance of such places in cult cultural memory and how they are transformed. Uh, this bookstore had a really uh, old tradition in the neighborhood, and they had to move out because of the increase in rent prices uh, due to this gentrification project in the neighborhood. And uh, actually their removal became a solidarity, turned into a solidarity event people came together and carried the boxes from hand to hand. And it shows it's really significant in, in the cultural memory. And also, uh, this is also, of course, a part of many projects, many similar projects going on in the area. And this was a reaction not only to this bookstore, to removal of this bookstore, but the reaction to, to everything that's going on. It's just one example. Uh, and unfortunately now, uh, in the place of this bookstore, there is a luxurious jewelry store. <clears throat> well, uh, okay, where am I? Huh? Considering this uh, urban agenda, uh, I want to look at the rural narratives that leave the city behind now. Uh, directors of Turkish art house cinema follow the path of a realism that can be traced in Slav uh, cinema. This term is used to define a film style mainly associated with a durational aesthetic, an emphasis on less editing and more observation. Long takes and deep focus shots take the place of fast editing that we see in the conventional films. Simple situations of everyday life are more important than action-driven events in these films. And these films require the active participation of the audience. Narratives, they don't attempt to make the viewer believe, but instead encourage them to see and think. 
So realist rural films in new Turkish cinema uh, can be considered as a part of this cinematic tendency. As common in slow cinema, they take the deep observation of natural environment as the main tool of creating the rhythm and meaning in a scene. I take examples from three films to identify aesthetic and narrative qualities. Okay, uh, long takes, close-ups, and wide-angle shots that foreground natural environment in most scenes determine the nature-based aesthetic of these films. Some shots are, on average, between one and seven minutes long, thus natural environment occupy a significant place. Images capture the small random moments, rhythms of nature and everyday life. Non-human nature is presented as witness to the situations in the scenes through visual narrative. Animal and plants are sometimes portrayed as parts of silent dialogues with humans. It's mostly the screen time, close-up shots, and the camera transitions between the characters and the non-human nature that intensify a sense of connection. And atmospheric sounds are prominent, more prominent than the human speech throughout the films. The long-standing silences and limited dialogues appear to be opening space for the voices of non-human nature. <clears throat> the main commonality of the film narratives is that it is the rural, which is the location where stories unfold. All stories deal with the issue of belonging as they follow the characters that feel alienated either to their living spaces, past memories, or the society in general. Except in Clause of May, film characters don't have a labor work, but more a psychophysical affinity with non-human nature. Personal encounters with natural environment become reflections of characters, memory, subconscious, and inner world. To give specific examples, I'll have a closer look to two films. Big Big World follows the story of Ali and Zuhal, orphan teenagers who grew up together like brother and sister. Zuhal is abused and forced to an arranged marriage under the care of a foster family. Ali commits a crime to save her, and they find themselves on the run, away from the city, into the woods. Orphanhood here helps the director to build his story around the issue of belonging. The characters find refuge in the woods, far from the cruelty of the society. Urban stands as a space of exclusion and patriarchal authority for characters, with a highlight on faster movements and darker colors in visual terms. The industrial landscape and concretion are foregrounded in these scenes. And forest stands as a space exempt from human hierarchy and authority. There are longer takes that reveal slower rhythms, visually warmer colors and softer contrasts that give a sense of unity and ease. In the film, Zuhal spends a long time in the woods as Ali has to keep working in the nearest town. She encounters a senile woman, communicates with animals. This turns into a silent spiritual connection in time as the old woman dies and Zuhal spends time with the corpse. Death and life intertwines. She feels the corpse as alive as the natural environment. Animals and plants are foregrounded as cohabitants and witnesses with extreme close-ups and long takes. They have presence in their own rhythm as much as the human characters. The director uses the image of sleeping in nature's bosom as a metaphor in many of his films. We see his characters 
almost integrated to natural environment while sleeping in identical scenes, sleeping as a shelter, path to inner world and energy of life interconnects with natural environment. The forest is not a safe heaven as characters eventually face uncanny strangers and can't escape from the human cruelty. Ali gets swindled and loses his job. Zuhal gets physically ill and mentally disturbed by memories. Her body responds with a miscarriage. Rather than idealizing the nature, what the film does is more like positioning the degradation in hum human relations as unnatural, encouraging the viewer to think how humans break the law of nature by their corrupted relations in the first place. And the uh, last film I want to <laughs> offer is Egg, which is the story of Yusuf returning to his childhood town upon his mother's death. After the funeral, he is forced to suspend his return to Istanbul. In the meantime, he has to confront the ghosts of his past and the rhythms of the rural life. Egg is the first film of a trilogy that tells the life story of a character named Yusuf in different stories with commonalities. In the last film, titled Honey, we see that Yusuf's journey as a child takes shape with his father dying in the forest while searching for honey. The director in an interview explains that he takes honey as the soul of the forest. In Egg, Yusuf's return to his hometown turns into a spiritual search pursued in nature, which signifies a search for integrity and belonging in relation to his past and memories. In a short scene uh, where we have an idea about Yusuf's life in Istanbul, unsettlement is foregrounded. He doesn't have a home, sleeps where he works in a second-hand bookstore. Since the beginning of the film, natural environment draws Yusuf into a journey to his subconscious and memories. He heads towards the forest, falls asleep there, and wakes up from an old dream where we see him breaking a quail egg or trapped in an old well. Throughout the film, uh, Yusuf confronts himself and his past through a natural environment that almost takes the place of his mother, whom he couldn't communicate with until, until her death. Almost three, long, three minutes long, the opening scene foreshadows his mother's death. This scene follows the mother as she slowly walks towards the camera in a natural landscape and disappears into the forest, merging with the trees under the fog. There are many long uh, shots of landscape throughout the film. Some are devoid of human presence which gives a sense of greatness. And in some of them, the characters seem like an organic part of the space. And other scenes with long <laughs> detailed shots of plants and trees make them the participants in the scenes. In one of the last scenes, Yusuf merely surrenders himself to nature. The six minute long scene unsettles the human-animal uh, boundaries. And we witness Yusuf's emotions for the first time. He walks into the bush as he stops his car on his way back to Istanbul and confronts a giant dog that pulls him down. He stays immobile as it gets dark. And as the dog stands over him, growling occasionally, Yusuf suddenly starts weeping loudly. As he wakes up in the bush, he decides not to go back to Istanbul. I'm coming to the conclusion right now. Uh, I'm going to show you a video uh, for about four, four minutes uh, from the scenes, uh, the scenes from the films. But before that, uh, to conclude, 
Firstly, I would like to mention the potential of realist slow cinema as a form of narrative to encourage an intuitive perception of nature and the deeper reflection on human connection with non-human. In a sense, what this type of cinema can provide might be seen as an alternative nature experience. On the other hand, it is important to mention that films are valuable resources for observing the shifts in environment and society relations. They are witnesses of history, but also social symptoms. It was the German writer, sorry my pronunciation, Siegfried Krakauer, who developed this sociological take on film, most notably in his famous book From Caligari to Hitler. According to him, repeated film patterns provide insights on the societies of their time. They are the mirrors of the social unconscious, repressed realities, desires, and needs. As we have seen, a nature-based aesthetic and rural narratives dealing with a search for belonging are repeated patterns in recent Turkish films. I think the urban is the source of this tendency as it is a place that is left behind and distanced from in these films. In this respect, the analysis of these patterns in new Turkish cinema mirrors the physical and spiritual deficiencies related to the urban environment in contemporary Turkey. Now I will show the film. Thank you so much. <laughs>